With just a laptop, internet, and lines of code, you can create something truly zero to one. Learning to code is one of the best things you can do. And if I could go back in time, this is exactly how I would do it. I'll break up this video into three big chunks. The mindset, coding, and the developer environment. Everything I'm gonna tell you is parallelizable, which means there's no real order. And if you're not in college or a boot camp, great. This video is tailored for you. It's definitely harder, but if you're willing to put in the work, you can definitely learn how to code by yourself. In fact, if I could go back, I don't know if I would have gone to college. Let's get into it. Part one, your mindset. Coders think differently. We approach our lives and problems in a certain way. And I can confidently say my day-to-day -day life is different now that I'm a software engineer. Step 1.1, adopt a coding mindset. And what I mean by that is for every problem, inefficiency, annoyance in your life, you need to think there's a solution for this. I just need to find it. It might take me minutes, hours, or even days, but if I look hard enough, if I try hard enough, I will find it. And that means Google is your best friend. Your toaster is broken? All right, pull up YouTube and start searching. The internet modem is blinking yellow? Google the serial number and start investigating. There's a spider in your house and you wanna get rid of it? Yeah, I don't know if Google can help you there. You might just have to move houses. And what I'm saying might sound obvious, but it took me years to realize not everyone is like this. If you were ever wondering why your parents think you're IT support, well, here's your answer. Your parents can Google just as well as you can, but they don't believe they can. And to be a coder, you need to believe you can as a fundamental truth. Because when it's 4 a.m. and you're working on a programming assignment and you've tried everything, but you still can't figure out the bug, the only thing that'll keep you going is knowing there's a solution. You just need to find it. And that brings me to the second part of the coding mindset, humility. Trust me, when I was in college at TA Sessions, I'd be yelling at the top of my lungs, there's something wrong with my laptop, the code is right, I don't know what's going on, I don't write buggy code. The computer is never wrong. And the second I realized that and truly internalized it was the day I started growing in my coding journey. Step 1.2, learn how to problem solve. Have you ever wondered how airlines decide which airports to fly from and how shipping providers decide what packages make it on the plane or how classes are scheduled even though there are only so many auditoriums? Well, these are problems solved by algorithms that used to be done by hand. I mean, some pretty legendary woman got us to the moon with only chalk and blackboards. But today, the scale is just too massive. It would take lifetimes to solve these problems by hand. So we code. At the end of the day, coding is just a tool for problem solving. The hard part is the actual problem solving. Being a good coder means being good at learning, picking up new things and technologies quickly, understanding that there's a lot out there that you don't know, but you can learn it all with some time and patience. At every one of my internships and jobs, I had no experience with the languages they used. C Sharp at Schlumberger and Microsoft, Ruby on Rails at Gusto, and Golang at Bolt. But I learned them all. And at hackathons, my teammates would wanna use buzzwords like machine learning and the cloud, and I'd have no idea what they were saying, but I'd figure it out. And yes, you don't have to be a good computer scientist to be a good coder, but you do have to be a decent problem solver. And hands down, the best free resource to improve your problem solving skills is CS50, Harvard's introductory computer science course that all incoming freshmen take. You have an Ivy League education, one of the best intro computer science courses out there at your fingertips for free. Take advantage of it. CS50 will give you a broad overview of computer science algorithms and data structures. Is it necessary to learn how to code? No. Will it help you and accelerate your learning? Definitely. The class is language agnostic. You'll be exposed to C, SQL, Python, JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, all while working on real world problems in biology, cryptography, finance, forensics, and gaming. What you learn in this course will help you immensely with everything else I'm gonna talk about. At Rice, the first computer science class I took freshman year was Comp 140, basically Rice's version of CS50, and it energized me to continue my coding journey. Part two, learning how to code. Now that you've adopted the right mindset, it's time to learn how to code. I can't say the journey will always be rosy, but I promise it will be fulfilling. Step 2.1, learn one programming language deeply. The language you use to learn programming doesn't have to be the same language you eventually use at work or even in your personal projects but it's good to know one language really well, like your go-to. If you took CS50, you've been exposed to a bunch of languages, but for now, I'd recommend Python. It's the most beginner-friendly language, and for the most part, it reads like English. The data structures are really intuitive and it's not verbose. It isn't typed, which isn't ideal, but you can always use linters to optionally add typing. And this is probably the language you'll wanna use for coding interviews, so it's good to get comfortable with it now. 
To actually learn coding in Python, there are so many great resources out there. For now, you're gonna wanna focus on syntax and data structures. So follow an online course or look up some tutorials on YouTube. Make sure you learn about control flow, so if else statements, basic logic, and or not, loops, for and while loops, and objects, classes, and other object-oriented programming principles. In my opinion, these are the highest yield topics. And for data structures, don't worry too much about crazy optimized red black trees and whatnot. For now, focus on hash maps and arrays. Once you have a basic command of Python, move on to the next step. Step 2.2, learn scripting. Sometimes there'll be stuff you're doing that will feel really manual, like data manipulation or renaming files. Or sometimes you just wanna write code to produce code. You can write scripts on your terminal through bash scripts, but hopefully by this point you understand some Python so you can leverage it to automate some of your daily tasks. For example, let's say you wanna grab data from a CSV file and generate an insert SQL statement that you can copy paste into your database console. And imagine there are no nice libraries that can help you do this. It would take hours if you wanted to do this by hand. But with a simple Python script, you can generate this entire command, copy paste it into the database console, and you're good to go. You basically wrote Python code to generate an SQL query string. That's awesome. The great thing about scripting is you don't have to spin up a web app or worry about hosting your server. You can just write Python code and writing more and more Python will make you better at it. Coupled with a coding mindset, you now have a practical tool to solve some of your daily problems. Step 2.3, create a personal project. The first thing I do is sign up for a hackathon. In-person is best, but virtual is fine too. This is much like signing up for a marathon, so you feel motivated to go out there and train. A hackathon will give you the chance to create a project. You'll learn a lot, you'll work with other people, and it'll give you a taste of what real life software engineering feels like. Well, except real life software engineering projects aren't completed in 48 hours and you actually have to test your code and you're not as sleep deprived, but you get my point. You'll get a chance to create something that you can deliver to customers, in this case, the judges. I've said this many times in other videos. The best way to learn programming is by doing, and ideally you work on something you're passionate about. So pick a topic you're interested in and build something. There are a couple things I think are important here. First, you're gonna to wanna to pick a full stack project, which means there's a front end, a back end, some API message passing layer, and then a database to actually store the information. You can do everything in Python if you want through Flask or Django, but I'd actually recommend learning and using JavaScript. JavaScript is probably one of the most popular languages out there today, and it has great support for front end and back end. For the front end, I'd recommend React, and for the back end, some framework around Node. Express is a really popular one. Like Python, JavaScript is not typed, so I'd highly recommend using TypeScript, which is actually what industry uses, so it'd be a good precursor anyway. The awesome thing here is that there are so many stacks you can use. Mern is a really popular one, but there's no wrong answers. Just pick one and dive deep. For the message passing API layer, probably start off with the REST protocol, but if you're feeling extra bold, give GraphQL a try. And for the database, I'd recommend using MongoDB, which is very JavaScript-y and JSON-like. Or you can use a classic relational database like Postgres. For the backend server and database, feel free to host everything locally. But for bonus points, see if you can set up your infrastructure in AWS, Azure, or some other cloud provider, because that's how they do it in industry. If you're not feeling particularly inspired, here's a project I think gives you the most bang for your buck. Implement a stateful counter, which means the front end will have a number, a plus sign, and a minus sign to increment and decrement the counter, and maybe a reset button to set it back to zero. And stateful means if you close the app and reopen it, the count should continue from where it left off and this will force you to use a database to actually store the information. These are called CRUD apps for Create, Read, Update, Delete, the four basic functionalities any feature can have. By implementing this, you'll get experience across the stack and have a real-world project to show for your efforts. Step 2.4, practice for interviews. If you're watching this video, chances are at some point you wanna get a full-time software engineering job, and that means you're gonna to have to do coding interviews. And remember when I said just focus on Python syntax and hash maps and arrays? Well, I was in line. By now, you have a good grasp of the fundamentals. You're ready to pick up an interview book and start practicing. The classic book everyone knows is Cracking the Coding Interview, but it's honestly not my favorite. The solutions are in Java, which is completely unnecessary since Java is such a verbose language. I'd actually recommend elements of Python programming since the solutions will be in Python and you're already familiar with the language. For interviews, you'll need to be familiar with strings, arrays, hash maps, trees, graphs, queues, stacks, tries, and heaps, along with some basic algorithms like breadth-first search, depth-first search, and some other basic sorts and searches. I know it sounds like a lot, but you can get there with some practice. Chances you'll use any of this at the actual job? Close to zero. Chances you see these concepts in interviews? Pretty high. You should also learn recursion and practice it. Don't worry if you struggle. I struggle to this day. To truly prepare for interviews, I'd recommend doing practice problems on lead code and using these sites that allow you to mock interview other people and have them mock interview you. Part three, your developer experience. 
Now this isn't technically coding, but it's almost impossible to code without a solid developer environment. And remember, there's a stark distinction between writing code just to pass a coding assignment and building something in the real world, in a production environment. So honestly, I think getting comfortable with the tooling you're gonna end up using every day is probably the best investment you can make. Step 3.1, learn the terminal. You're gonna code on your laptop. Right now, you probably drag and drop things into Windows and right click to find what you were trying to do. And don't worry, I was just like you, but those days are gone, or they should be gone if you're trying to seriously code. Just like Command C is way better than right clicking and hitting copy, Navigating on your laptop through your terminal is way more efficient than using the user interface. You know those hackers you see in movies coding really fast? Well, all that is fake, but the one thing they got right is that they're using the terminal. And I promise you, sooner or later, you're gonna have to get comfortable with the terminal. So you might as well start now. Couple things here. If you're on Windows, I'm just gonna say it, the command line is not it. The Linux flavoring is way nicer, so I'd highly recommend you get the Bash subsystem for Linux. And if you're on Mac, I'd highly recommend using iTerm2. It's way nicer than the default terminal. Now you have a couple options. You can use the default shell, which is usually Bash, or you can use some wrapper like Zish, Oh My Zish, or Fish. No hard opinions here, but just pick one and learn it. And if it makes a difference, I personally use Oh My Zish. Get comfortable with the package manager and commands like sudo, ls, mv, rm, and so on. And the best way to do this is to force yourself to only use the terminal to navigate on your laptop. It's like when right-handed people want to become ambidextrous, they start brushing with their left hand. Let's say you want to move a bunch of files to a new directory and then open that folder in an editor. Cool, you can do it on the terminal. The terminal can be gnarly and you might have to Google a bunch and resolve all these dependencies, but that's great. More practice. Step 3.2, learn your way around an editor. I'm not a Vim or Emacs power user, and I'm not gonna debate you on tabs versus spaces. I mean, I do not get why anyone would use spaces over tabs. I mean, why not just use Vim over Emacs? <laughs> I do use Vim over Emacs. Oh, God help us. But trust me, you're gonna wanna know your way around a coding editor. My go-to in college was Sublime, but honestly, looking back, hands down, the best open source editor out there today is VS Code. So download it and start navigating around. Check out some extensions like Prettier and ESLint and browse through some themes and other settings and really just get comfortable with the whole environment. I'd also recommend any JetBrains IDE, like IntelliJ for Java or Golang for Golang. You're gonna have to buy a license, but these editors are powerful and they can level up your coding ability. Step 3.3, learn Git and become familiar with version control. If you've gotten this far, you probably know what Git is. You might've seen it while playing around in the terminal or used it in CS50 or used it during a personal project. Git is just a version control tool that allows you to save checkpoints of your work. You'll definitely use Git or some other source control tool throughout your career. I remember in my first hackathon, we were all coding all night and then we were finally ready to integrate our work and merge all our changes together. And we screwed up some Git command and lost everything. I'm not gonna lie, I'm still not the most proficient with Git, but you really only have to know the basics. Git pull, merge, rebase, commit, push. That's about it. Just remember, git commit often and you'll thank me later. And while you're at it, check out GitHub, either for your own personal project or just to check out an open source repository. You can see issues, pull requests, and the entire code base, which is pretty cool. And this is just a nice to have, but check out the readme because it's usually written in Markdown, which is a pretty sweet language to format plain text. Congrats. By this point, you're well on your way to becoming a coder. You think about things the right way, you have the drive and patience to stick with it, and you truly believe in your heart of hearts that you can do it. And you know Python and JavaScript, you have some projects under your belt, and you have a sound understanding of data structures and algorithms. You're ready for interviews and whatever else the world throws at you. I want to wish you good luck with everything that is to come. And just like everything else in life, it's the journey that matters, not the end result. Take a moment to see how far you've come. I'm proud of you. Keep at it. That's all I have for today. Till next time. Cheers.